Welcome to uh, this deep dive, you guys. We're going to be taking a look at the world through a very unique lens. Indeed. We've gotten tons of requests to cover the observations of uh, the one and only Philomena Kunk. A truly singular voice. Yeah. You know, we're talking about everything from climate change to royal scandals to pop culture to some pretty deep cuts into history. All filtered through Kunk's signature deadpan delivery. And for this deep dive, we're doing something a little different. We're going to treat Kunk's statements not as jokes or satire, right? but as completely authoritative. As gospel truth. Exactly. So strap yourselves in. We're diving headfirst into the Kunkiverse. Let's start with 2019. Oh, yeah. A year that Kunk kicks off with a rather striking comparison. Oh, yeah. She compares David Attenborough's climate documentary to a snuff film. Wow. Okay. So um, she doesn't hold back, does she? But you know what I find fascinating about this is if we actually accept that as a factual statement. Right. It raises some really interesting questions. Are we, in a sense, watching the planet die in real time through these documentaries? It certainly forces us to confront the uncomfortable reality of climate change in a very visceral way. Right. Maybe that dark humor is a coping mechanism. Perhaps. And then Kunk dives into Greta Thunberg. Ah, yes. And she questions her connection to Eurovision. Apparently her mother was a contestant. And this is where Kunk's authority as we're treating it really shines. If we consider this connection as crucial, it kind of changes the whole narrative. Absolutely. Suddenly we're not just looking at, you know, a young activist, but potentially someone groomed for the spotlight from childhood. Wow. That's a completely different way of looking at it. And Kunk doesn't stop there. She also observes adults mocking Greta, this teenager who's simply speaking truth to power. And if her pronouncements are true, then this widespread mockery we see isn't just about climate change. It's about the suppression of uncomfortable truths delivered by a messenger who disrupts the established order. Fascinating. Kunk then moves on to another major event of 2019. Yes. The Prince Andrew scandal. And specifically, she dissects his disastrous interview with laser focus on his alibi, Pizza Express. So if we take Kunk at her word, then this seemingly insignificant detail becomes the linchpin of the entire scandal. It does indeed. It completely changes the narrative, doesn't it? Absolutely. And it raises questions about what other seemingly trivial details we might be overlooking in, you know, major events. What if the key to understanding global politics actually lies in the choice of takeout? That's a deep thought. Next up, she tackles the Chernobyl disaster. Oh, yes. But not in the way you might expect. Kunk reimagines Chernobyl as a flower-based catastrophe. Caused by widespread flower allergies. Caused by widespread flower allergies. Wow. And this is where Kunk's genius really shines. She completely reframes our understanding of this event. If flour, a seemingly innocuous ingredient, can have such devastating consequences, what else are we underestimating? It makes you look at everything differently. It does. It really does. Kunk forces us to question the very nature of reality itself. What if our scientific understanding is fundamentally flawed? Exactly. She's challenging us to rethink our assumptions about the world. Okay, so now Kunk takes us into the world of cinema. Okay. Starting with, once upon a time in Hollywood, she notes the focus on fictional characters over Sharon Tate, the real-life victim of the Manson murders. Right. And if we accept Kunk's authority, then Tarantino is deliberately obscuring the truth. Yes. Prioritizing entertainment over historical accuracy. Precisely. So are we being manipulated by Hollywood? Are we being fed a distorted version of reality? Punk certainly suggests that, and it makes you wonder how many other films are twisting historical events for dramatic effect. Yeah. Next, she turns her attention to Joker, and she suggests that the film might inspire violence. Right. But quickly adds that mass shootings are already commonplace in America. A chilling observation. If she's right, then Joker is simply mirroring the violence that's already endemic in American society. Yeah. It's a dark reflection of reality. But is Kunk suggesting that art imitates life, or is it the other way around? It's a question worth pondering. It is. And it leads us to the next chapter of our Kunkian exploration, a deep dive into British history. Here we go. Fasten your seatbelts, folks. Things are about to get really interesting. Kunk begins with the formation of Great Britain, highlighting the pivotal role of King James. Right. And of course, she has a unique way of explaining it. She compares King James to Simon Cowell. Okay. Now, this seemingly absurd analogy actually reveals a rather profound insight. If we accept Kunk's authority, then both James and Cowell are masterminds of unification. They both possess this ability to bring together disparate elements and create a cohesive whole. 
So is Kung suggesting that the formation of Great Britain was essentially a 17th century boy band audition? It's a provocative thought, isn't it? It is. And it makes you wonder what other historical events might have been orchestrated by figures with the charisma and ruthlessness of a pop music mogul. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, so Kunk then takes us on this whirlwind tour of key historical events. Yes. The gunpowder plot, Oliver Cromwell, the plague, the great fire of London, it's all there delivered with that classic Kunk deadpan. And each event is presented with equal weight and importance. Right. If Kunk is right, then a failed assassination attempt is just as significant as a devastating plague. Wow. It challenges our traditional hierarchies of historical significance. Yeah. It's history as Kunk sees it. Yeah. And honestly, who are we to question her authority? Exactly. She's the ultimate narrator of our past, present, and future. And this brings us to the heart of our Kunkian journey. Okay. Where do we go from here? Deeper. We explore Kunk's take on everything from the Big Bang to the Beatles. Oh, wow. We unearth the hidden truths embedded in her pronouncements. Um, and of course, we try to make sense of it all. All right. Well, stay tuned for part two of our deep dive into the Kunkiverse. Welcome back to our deep dive into the Kunkiverse. Where we're treating every word uttered by Philomena Kunk as gospel truth. Precisely. And now we're going even further back in time. Oh, uh, wow. To the <laughs> very origins of the universe. Okay. Kunk tackles the Big Bang. All right. And her explanation is, uh, well, unique. Lay it on us. She describes the universe starting as something like an orange, and then you imagine it's not there. And, and then not. you do that with everything else until there's nothing at all. Okay. It's a simplification, of course, but a profound one. Right. Kunk is highlighting the concept of nothingness. Yeah. The void from which all existence emerged. Yeah. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? To think that everything we know, everything we are, came from literally nothing. It really is. But Kunk doesn't stop there. Okay. She goes on to explain the extinction of the dinosaurs. Oh, yeah, she do that. Suggesting they died out because of the barbaric conditions of zoos. Oh, wow. Now, if we accept this as fact, it raises some disturbing questions about our own relationship with the natural world. But it is. Are we with our zoos and aquariums repeating the mistakes of a lost civilization? It's a sobering thought. And it leads us to Kunk's exploration of early humans. Yes. She points out that, you know, men like her didn't just appear fully clothed on Earth. She's right, of course. Human evolution was a long and complex process. And Kunk, in her own way, acknowledges this by using a rather unusual visual aid oh. to demonstrate the slow pace of change. Classic Kunk move. Using humor to make a complex scientific concept accessible. Right. But there's also a deeper message here. Okay. Kunk is reminding us that progress takes time. Right. That change doesn't happen overnight. That's a good point. Yeah, especially in today's fast-paced world, right? Yeah. We're constantly bombarded with new information, new technologies, new trends. Exactly. But Kunk is urging us to slow down. Yes. To appreciate the gradual unfolding of history. Precisely. Next, Kunk takes us through the Stone Age. Oh, yeah. Noting that Stone Age man used stones to make basic weapons and tools, which she describes as... S by today's standards. Okay. It's a blunt assessment, but an accurate one. Right. The tools of the Stone Age were primitive compared to the sophisticated technology we have today. Of course. But Kunk's observation is not simply a statement of fact. Yep. It's a yeah. celebration of human ingenuity. Right. A recognition of our ability to adapt and innovate. Yeah. From the crude tools of the Stone Age, we leap forward to the Roman invasion of Britain. Ah, yes. And... Kunk seems particularly perplexed by the fact that the Romans didn't actually originate in Britain. Right. She asks, where did they come from? It's a valid question. Yeah. And one that highlights the interconnectedness of history. Right. The Roman Empire was vast spanning continents. Yes. And their influence reached far beyond their borders. Absolutely. Kunk's confusion reminds us that history is not a series of isolated events. Right. But a complex tapestry of interconnected narratives. That's a beautiful way of putting it, yeah. And she describes the Romans arriving with Latin pre-installed and teaching the primitive locals how to wash and walk on their hind legs. Again, a simplification, right, but right. one that captures the essence of the cultural exchange that occurred during the Roman occupation. Yeah. The Romans brought with them new ideas, new technologies, new ways of life. Yeah. And their influence can still be felt in Britain today. Yeah, absolutely. Kunk then details the Romans' victory over the Celts. Right. And she suggests that... The Celts' decision to fight naked might have been a tactical error. 
It's a humorous observation. Right. But one that underscores the importance of strategy and preparedness in warfare. Of course. The Romans were a highly organized and disciplined fighting force. Yeah. And their superior tactics gave them a decisive advantage. Right. Kunk highlights the Romans' contributions to British life. Yes. Including the construction of Hadrian's Wall, the establishment of Colchester as the capital, and the introduction of coins and primitive 8-bit computer game graphics. It's a kunkified version of Roman innovations. Right. Blending fact with her own unique interpretations. Right. She acknowledges the Romans' impact on British infrastructure economy and even early forms of visual representation. Right. But of course, no discussion of the Romans would be complete without mentioning their love of baths. Of course. Which Kunk describes as an early example of gentrification, comparing it to someone opening an artisan bakery in Hull. It's a brilliant analogy. It is. Highlighting the way Roman culture, with its emphasis on luxury and leisure, would have seemed alien and even intrusive to the native Britons. Mm. It's a reminder that progress and innovation can often come at a cost. Right. Particularly for those who are displaced or marginalized by such changes. That's a very good point. Mm. Kunk then marvels at the Roman invention of roads. Right. Suggesting that before roads, people traveled by standing at the edge of their village and seeing how far they could jump. It's a ridiculous notion, of course. Yeah. But it serves to highlight the transformative impact of Roman infrastructure. Yeah. Roads connected communities, facilitated trade, and enabled the movement of armies profoundly altering the landscape of Britain. Yeah. Kunk turns her attention to Queen Boudicca. Yes. Describing her as a rebel from Norfolk who hated the Romans. Right. She notes that Boudicca's army fought back with the weapon they knew best spikes and ultimately lost. Kunk's portrayal of Boudicca is simplistic but captures her fierce resistance to Roman rule. The image of Boudicca's army armed with spikes highlights the disparity in military technology between the Romans and the native Britons. And then Kunk describes the Romans having to rush home wow. because they had left a complete collapse of civilization on. Right. This leaves Britain to enter the Dark Ages, a period she describes as mysterious because the Romans had taken the last pens with them. Leading her to discuss King Arthur, yeah. a figure she claims came a lot. He came a lot. Yes. And when you try to correct her explaining that Arthur is associated with the court of Camelot, Kunk insists that it definitely says King Arthur came a lot. This exchange perfectly encapsulates Kunk's comedic style. Indeed. A blend of willful ignorance, misinterpretations, and a refusal to be corrected. Right. It's this unwavering commitment to her own absurd logic that makes her so entertaining. Absolutely. Next, Kunk highlights St. George, the mega patriot and dragon slayer. Okay. Noting that we know the dragon slaying definitely happened because of a painting depicting the event. She also suggests that the dragon slaying probably happens somewhere in Wales. So again, Kunk blends historical figures and events with her own fictionalized interpretations. Yes. Her reliance on the painting as evidence showcases her naive approach to historical analysis. Exactly. Kunk expresses surprise when you reveal that St. George wasn't actually English. Oh, really? She also questions why St. George was made a saint after slaying the dragon, asking, what's better than a saint? So Kunk's bewilderment at St. George's non-English origins further underscores her tendency to view history through a narrow nationalistic lens. Yes. Her question about sainthood reveals a fundamental misunderstanding of religious hierarchies. Precisely. Kunk then recounts the Viking invasions, right. describing the Vikings as arriving from Denmark, wearing metal helmets, which they'd somehow managed to pull over the terrifying skull horns that jutted from their heads. Okay, so this image of Vikings with horns is, of course, a common misconception. It is. Kunk perpetuates this myth, further blurring the lines between historical fact and popular imagination. Indeed. She then explains that the Vikings interbred with the local population, yeah. causing them to lose their distinctive horns and become indistinguishable from normal humans. So Kunk's description of Viking assimilation, while absurd, yes. touches upon the complex process of cultural integration that occurred throughout British history. It does. All right, Kunk then takes us to the year 1066 and the Battle of Hastings. Ah, yes. She provides a detailed analysis of the Bayeux Tapestry, which she describes as an accurate visual record of the whole thing. She points out various scenes depicted on the tapestry, including Norman archers steaming in on their blue horses, a stick fight bit, chopped up people, and goose monsters in the sky. 
Kunk's interpretation of the Bayou tapestry is hilariously off base. Right. Yet it highlights the tapestry's ability to capture the chaos and brutality of battle. Yes. Her descriptions, while inaccurate, convey the visceral impact of the tapestry's imagery. She then describes King Harold's death, noting that he triumphantly caught an arrow in his eye, but sadly died soon after. She adds, no one knows why. Kunk's flippant remark about Harold's death underscores her detached, almost callous approach to historical events. Yeah. She presents the Battle of Hastings as a spectacle, focusing on the visual details rather than the human cost. With the Norman victory, Kunk explains that Britain was suddenly part of Europe, comparing it mm. to Brexit backwards. Kunk's comparison of the Norman conquest to Brexit is surprisingly apt. It is. Highlighting the cyclical nature of British history. Right. The Norman invasion, like Brexit, represented a dramatic shift in Britain's relationship with Europe. Kunk then discusses the Doomsday Book, right. describing it as the internet of its day. Right. She is particularly interested in a curse that is supposedly attached to the book. Her fascination with the curse reveals her interest in the supernatural, yeah. a recurring theme throughout her historical analyses. Next Next, Kunk delves into the reign of King James, who she credits with bringing England, Scotland, and Wales together, like Simon Cowell when he brought together One Direction. This analogy, while absurd, highlights the unifying power of a strong leader. Kunk recognizes the significance of James's achievement, albeit through a pop culture lens. She then discusses the gunpowder plot. Okay claiming that the plotters were caught because they wrote their names on the wall behind them. This fictionalized account of the gunpowder plot showcases Kunk's tendency to invent her own historical narratives. Moving on to Oliver Cromwell. All oh, right. Kunk notes that he wanted Parliament dissolved, but mm -hmm. nobody could find a glass big enough. Okay. She then describes the English Civil War as being like a fight between Wayne Rooney and Noel Fielding, but not as funny. Again, Kunk uses humor to make sense of complex historical events. Yeah. Her analogy of the Civil War to a celebrity boxing match trivializes the conflict, reducing it to a clash of personalities. Right. She then recounts the execution of King Charles I, describing his severed head as rolling regally along the ground, pumping blood everywhere and getting covered in hay and dirt and dried up flecks of dignified fox. This graphic description, while darkly humorous, underscores the brutality of the Civil War and the unceremonious end of Charles's reign. Then, Kunk describes the return of King Charles II, followed by the reappearance of the plague in 1665. Right. She asks, why did they decide to have the plague twice? More than anything, it must have just been boring. Kunk's flippant remark about the plague reveals her callous disregard for human suffering. Yeah. Her suggestion that the plague was boring further highlights her detachment from historical events. She then discusses the Great Fire of London, right. questioning how we know that no other cities burned down. When you explain that we have records of other cities that didn't burn down, Kunk suggests that there might have been another place burnt down that just burnt down completely, and now we don't know because it's not there because it was burnt down. Kunk's circular reasoning is a hallmark of her comedic style. It is. She presents a ludicrous argument with unwavering conviction, forcing the expert to engage with her nonsensical logic. Moving on to Isaac Newton. All right. Okay. Kunk questions whether everything was just floating up to the sky before he discovered gravity. When you explain that gravity always existed, Kunk asks why it doesn't work on kites. Kunk's misunderstanding of gravity is both humorous and revealing. Yeah. Her question about kites demonstrates a lack of basic scientific knowledge. Right. While her skepticism towards the concept of gravity itself is a testament to her unwavering belief in her own absurd worldview. Right. She then suggests that the best example of gravity today is the game show Tipping Point, arguing that without gravity, that wouldn't work, would it? This unexpected connection between a scientific concept and a popular game show is classic kunk. Yeah. She finds humor in the mundane drawing absurd parallels between seemingly disparate elements of human experience. Next, kunk turns her attention to Horatio Nelson. All right. Questioning why he always had one hand up his jumper. When you explain that Nelson lost most of his right arm, kunk suggests that he might have been just trying to make his story more interesting. Kunk's skepticism towards Nelson's injury is a recurring theme. Yeah. She often questions the veracity of historical accounts, That's right. suggesting that historical figures might have embellished their stories for personal gain or notoriety. Kunk then describes Nelson's victory at the Battle of Trafalgar, noting that it took place here in Trafalgar Square. Right. She points out that back then all this would have been underwater, with only the top of Nelson's column visible. 
This, um, she then discusses the Romantic movement, mistaking it for a condiment. Right. When you try to explain that Romanticism was an artistic and literary movement, Kunk expresses disappointment, saying, we're going to have to rethink this whole interview. This exchange highlights Kunk's comedic timing and her ability to subvert expectations. Yeah. Her sudden disinterest in the interview when she realizes Romanticism isn't a food item is both unexpected and hilarious. It is. Kunk then asks you about Lord Byron, describing him as sexy like Mick Jagger, brooding like Kurt Cobain, and he had brown hair like Harry Styles. This pop culture-infused description of Byron is classic Kunk. Yeah. She draws parallels between historical figures and modern celebrities, making the past feel more relatable, albeit in a somewhat superficial way. She expresses surprise when you reveal that Byron slept with his sister, asking, would that have shocked people or was everyone sleeping with the sister back then? Kung's question reveals her naivete about social norms and taboos. Right. Her assumption that incest might have been commonplace in the past highlights her lack of historical context. Kunk then praises Jane Austen's writing, noting that the sentences have sometimes got some nice balancing clauses with a lot of humor in them. She then questions why Austen's books are constantly adapted for film and television, suggesting that there are only about five of them, whereas there are 50 Mr. Men books, and they haven't done all of those yet. Kunk's literary analysis is both simplistic and humorous. It is. She reduces Austen's work to its grammatical structure, while her comparison to Mr. Men books reveals a preference for simple formulaic narratives. Moving on to the 20th century, Kunk begins with a discussion of Edward Elgar, okay. whom she initially mistakes for a caveman. Right. She then expresses confusion about how Elgar converted his tunes into orchestra mode. Kunk's ignorance of basic musical concepts is played for laughs. Right. Her bewilderment at the process of orchestration highlights her lack of understanding of musical composition. She then turns her attention to the BBC, questioning whether various BBC programs inform, educate, or entertain. She includes a trick question asking about a program called Inspector Phillips, which she made up. Kunk's quiz about BBC programming showcases her fascination with popular culture and her tendency to conflate fact and fiction. Right. Her inclusion of a trick question reveals her mischievous side. Next, Kunk discusses Winston Churchill, noting that returning soldiers rewarded him by voting him out of office. Right. She then laments the crumbling British Empire, observing that places like India decided they weren't British after all. This observation, while stated in a matter-of-fact tune, actually touches upon the complex themes of colonialism and decolonization. Right. Kung's surprise at former colonies asserting their independence reveals her ingrained belief in British exceptionalism. Kunk then discusses George Orwell's 1984, describing it as a book that depicts a world in which people are manipulated by screens, manipulated by the media, manipulated by the government. She adds something which thankfully didn't and couldn't happen. Kunk's dismissive attitude towards Orwell's dystopian vision is ironic, given that many of the themes explored in the book, yeah. such as surveillance propaganda and the erosion of privacy, have become increasingly relevant in the digital age. She then notes that the only thing Orwell got right was the concept of Big Brother, although she adds that he didn't predict that it would eventually be on Channel 5. This jab at Channel 5 is typical of Kunk's humor. Yeah. She often incorporates pop culture references and topical jokes into her historical analyses. Kunk then discusses the post-war labor government, comparing it to a cross between Jeremy Corbyn and the Taliban. This outlandish comparison highlights Kunk's tendency to make sweeping generalizations and draw absurd parallels between seemingly unrelated political ideologies. Next. Kunk delves into the Beatles, okay. claiming that they became influenced by American wombles known as hippies. Right. She describes LSD as a drug that made the user see and hear things that weren't really happening, a bit like Netflix. Kunk's description of LSD's effects is both humorous and revealing. It is. Her comparison to Netflix highlights the way technology can alter our perceptions of reality. She then suggests that the Beatles' music turned psychopathic after they started taking LSD right. and questions why they weren't disqualified from the charts. Kunk's use of the word psychopathic to describe the Beatles' music is both absurd and amusing. Yeah. Her question about chart disqualification reveals her naivete about the music industry and its standards. Kunk then credits the Beatles with discovering color, comparing them to Sir Walter Raleigh and his potatoes. This nonsensical analogy is typical of Kunk's humor. Yeah. She often draws unexpected connections between historical events and figures creating a sense of absurdist chaos. She then discusses the miniskirt, questioning whether they actually were shorter or if people's legs were getting longer. 
Kunk's fixation on the length of miniskirts highlights her fascination with fashion and social trends. Right. Her suggestion that people's legs might have been getting longer reveals her misunderstanding of basic anatomy. She then asks whether there was a miniskirt for men, suggesting trousers that just stopped under the bells. This provocative question is both humorous and thought-provoking. It is. Kunk challenges gender norms and expectations, albeit in a somewhat crude and simplistic way. Kunk then discusses the sexual revolution, describing the pill as a condom you could eat and a sort of get-out-of-child-free card. This description of the pill is both inaccurate and amusing. Right. Kunk's focus on the pill's contraceptive properties reveals her understanding of its significance in liberating women's sexuality. She then describes the decriminalization of homosexuality, noting that for years, homosexuality was illegal and gay men were sent to prison, whereas punishment, they'd have to share a tiny room with a man for years. This observation, while stated in a deadpan tone, actually highlights the absurdity and cruelty of past laws criminalizing homosexuality. Kunk then observes that for the first time ever, Britain was cool, not just the weather. This self-congratulatory remark is typical of Kunk's nationalistic pride. She often celebrates British achievements, even when those achievements are questionable or based on misinterpretations. She then celebrates England's victory over Germany in the 1966 World Cup, noting that they bounced a ball into a net rather than a bomb into a dam, killing far fewer civilians. This comparison of a sporting event to warfare highlights Kunk's tendency to trivialize violence and downplay the horrors of war. Moving on to the 1970s, Kunk discusses Prime Minister Edward Heath, whom she describes as a real man of the people, with his love of yachts, classical music, and church organs. This ironic description of Heath's elitist tastes underscores the disconnect between the political class and the everyday lives of ordinary people. She then describes Britain's entry into the European common market as Brentrance, lamenting that the term was never adopted. This invented term is both humorous and revealing of Kunk's nationalistic perspective. Right. She views Britain's relationship with Europe as a distinct entity separate from the broader European project. Kunk then discusses the punk movement, describing punks as antisocial, cynical, and dangerous. She notes that the most shocking thing the Sex Pistols did was swearing on TV. Kunk's focus on the Sex Pistols' profanity, rather than their music or message, reveals her conservative sensibilities and her tendency to be shocked by anything that challenges societal norms. She then turns her attention to Margaret Thatcher. Okay. Questioning why she set interest rates so high allowed the exchange rate to go so high and caused huge unnecessary suffering. This line of questioning, while phrased in a Kunkian manner, actually touches upon legitimate criticisms of Thatcher's economic policies. Kunk then celebrates Thatcher's victory in the Falklands War, noting that she bravely ordering troops to fight and die on her behalf. This flippant remark underscores Kunk's callous disregard for the human cost of war. She then discusses the miners' strike, asking, why was it considered minor? When you try to explain that it wasn't considered minor, Kunk asks, what's a mine, and then what's coal? This exchange highlights Kunk's comedic timing and her ability to feign ignorance. Her questions about mining and coal are clearly disingenuous, designed to frustrate the expert and prolong the joke. Kunk then recounts Thatcher's downfall, noting that she left Downing Street crying tears down her face, which she'd never done before in case it rusted. This image of Thatcher crying in case it rusted is both absurd and hilarious. Yeah. It reinforces the perception of Thatcher as an unfeeling, machine-like figure. She then describes John Major as a prime minister who was as fearsome as he looked, presiding over another period of recession. This backhanded compliment is typical of Kunk's humor. Right. She often praises historical figures in a way that is both insincere and subtly insulting. Kunk then lists various cultural touchstones of the 1990s. Okay. Including Oasis, The Spice Girls, Suede Chris Evans' take that Damien Hirst trains botting Mr. Blobby, Jamie Oliver Moped's ironic wanking. <laughs> The Italian job and Chris oh, Evans. Evans. Chris Evans and Chris Evans. This eclectic mix of high and low culture perfectly captures the spirit of the 1990s. It did done. A decade marked by both artistic innovation and a resurgence of laddish culture. She then asks you why more people voted for Tony Blur than Oasis in the 1997 general election. Okay. When you try to correct her saying Blair, Kunk repeatedly insists on saying blur. That's a running gag as a testament to Kunk's comedic persistence. Yeah. Her refusal to acknowledge the correct pronunciation of Tony Blair's name is both frustrating and hilarious. 
Kunk then discusses the death of Princess Diana, noting that it came at a bad time for a nation that had just got really into being judgmental about her sex life. This observation, while crass, reflects the shifting public attitudes towards Diana in the years leading up to her death. She then praises Tony Blair's eulogy for Diana, in which he called her the People's Princess, even though she wasn't from Peebles, she was from Norfolk. Kung's focus on the geographical inaccuracy of Blair's statement highlights her pedantic nature and her tendency to miss the bigger picture. She then recounts Blair's involvement in the Iraq War, noting that it proved about as popular as infanticide-flavored crisps. This darkly humorous analogy perfectly captures the public's disapproval of the Iraq War. Kunk then describes Gordon Brown as a man with all the carefree joy de vivre of a haunted cave in Poland. Okay. She also notes that Brown knew mainly about coins which wouldn't help him because all the coins were about to implode during the financial crisis. This description of Brown as a joyless figure obsessed with a failing financial system perfectly encapsulates the public's perception of him during the financial crisis. From there, Kunk jumps to a discussion of early humans. Okay. Marveling at the fact that they are literally on the planet right oh, now. Right. She then sets out to explore how humankind transformed our world from being a load of pointless nature to modern things. This framing of human history as a progression from pointless nature to modern things reveals Kunk's anthropocentric worldview and her tendency to view progress as inherently positive. She then asks you who invented civilization and is surprised to learn that he was invented in Mesopotamia by person or persons unknown. Kunk's surprise at the anonymity of civilization's inventors highlights her naive belief that all significant historical events have clearly identifiable authors. She then asks whether Mesopotamians had feet and eyebrows and that sort of thing, expressing relief when you confirm that they did have the whole set of um, organs, holes, yeah. bits that work together, um, bits on the outside, bits on the inside. This exchange showcases Kunk's comedic timing and her ability to feign ignorance about basic human anatomy. Kunk then discusses the invention of the wheel, <laughs> explaining its function in a surprisingly accurate, albeit somewhat convoluted way. Right. She then moves on to mathematics, asking whether numbers were worth less back in ancient times or if they had the same value as now, only bigger. Okay. When you confirm that numbers had the same value in ancient times, Kunk asks, and did they have the same number of numbers as we do, you know, from 1 to 700, with 700 being the biggest number? Kunk's belief that 700 is the biggest number is a testament to her limited mathematical understanding. She then describes the abacus as a device that allowed people to count how many possessions they owned adding that it was a short step from this to the invention of money in the form of cash. This simplified account of the development of currency highlights Kung's tendency to reduce complex historical processes to their most basic elements. Kung then laments the invention of writing, asking whether it was a significant development or more of a flash in the pan like rap metal. This comparison of writing to rap metal is both unexpected and humorous. It is. It reveals Kunk's dismissive attitude towards certain forms of artistic expression. She then describes emojis as handmade language that still endures, noting that the ancient Egyptians who invented them called them hieroglyphics. This conflation of emojis and hieroglyphics is both absurd and revealing. Right. It suggests that Kunk views modern communication technologies as simply rehashed versions of ancient forms of expression. Kunk then discusses the pyramids, observing that they are basically big triangles with a sort of square ass. She questions why pyramids are that shape, asking, is it to stop homeless people sleeping on them? This question, while seemingly naive, actually touches upon the social function of architecture and the way design can be used to exclude or marginalize certain groups. When you inform her that ancient Egypt likely didn't have many homeless people, Kunk expresses surprise, stating that people looked after each other and helped each other. This idealistic view of ancient Egyptian society contrasts with Kunk's generally cynical outlook on human nature. She then asks how the Egyptians built the pyramids, questioning whether they started at the top and worked down or started at the bottom and worked up. This seemingly obvious question is typical of Kunk's comedic style. Right. She often feigns ignorance about basic concepts, forcing the expert to state the obvious. Kunk then discusses the Egyptian practice of mummification, asking, has a mummy ever ridden a bicycle? This non sequitur is both absurd and hilarious. Yeah. It highlights Kunk's tendency to derail conversations with unexpected and irrelevant questions. She then expresses amazement at the fact that ancient Egyptians were obsessed with dead people, even though they were all dead themselves. 
This observation, while stated in a matter-of-fact tone, actually touches upon the human fascination with mortality and the afterlife. She then asks how the Egyptians mummified people, mm. listening intently as you describe the gruesome process. Kunk's fascination with mummification reveals her morbid curiosity and her interest in the macabre. She then moves on to ancient Greece, describing it as the country, not the musical. Right. She notes that the ancient Greeks invented lots of things we still have today, like medicine and olives and lots of things that have died out, like democracy and pillars. This humorous observation about the selective endurance of ancient Greek innovations highlights the arbitrary nature of historical progress. Kunk then discusses Greek tragedies, asking whether the events depicted in them are still sad. Okay. And you confirm that they are. Kunk asks, but it was so long ago, why should I care? This callous remark reveals Kunk's lack of empathy and her inability to connect with human suffering, even when it's presented in a fictionalized context. She then dismisses Greek tragedy, saying, Maybe I'm cold, but I just don't give a sus about people in ancient Greece. This blunt statement is both shocking and humorous. It highlights Kunk's self-awareness and her willingness to embrace her own lack of compassion. Kunk then describes the Olympic Games as a kind of theater for stupid people, noting that the Greeks started the Games without inviting other countries to ensure Greece would win. This cynical view of the Olympics reveals Kunk's tendency to view all human endeavors as inherently self-serving and competitive. She then expresses surprise upon learning that athletes competed naked in the early Olympics. Kunk's shock at the nudity of ancient athletes highlights her prudishness and her discomfort with the human body. She then asks you about the human brain claiming that it's full of pipes. Okay. She then asks whether it's best to break up big ideas into lots of little thoughts about the size of peas and squeeze them through in quick succession, mm -hmm. or just bite the bullet and force it through your mind pipe in one huge cloud, like gritting your teeth and thinking for dear life. This bizarre analogy of the brain as a plumbing system reveals Kunk's lack of understanding of basic neurology. She then discusses Alexander the Great, describing him as a megastar with his own empire. She notes that Alexander conquered everything from Persia to India and then died because he was only 32. This matter-of-fact account of Alexander's conquests and untimely death underscores Kunk's detached approach to history. She then moves on to Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China, describing him as the first cartoon character to found his own empire. Okay. She notes that he built the Great Wall of China, which she mistakenly believes is the only landmark audible from space. Kung's description of Qin Shi Huang as a cartoon character highlights her tendency to view historical figures as two-dimensional caricatures. Right. Her belief that the Great Wall of China is audible from space reveals her lack of scientific knowledge. When you inform her that the Great Wall of China is not audible from space, Kunk concludes that it must be invisible. This logical leap is typical of Kunk's thought process. Yeah. She often jumps to absurd conclusions based on incomplete or faulty information. She then asks whether China has a roof, suggesting the existence of a great roof of China. This question highlights Kunk's childlike curiosity and her tendency to view the world through a simplistic lens. Kunk then discusses the Roman Empire, noting that despite the fancy columns and mosaics, there was an emptiness at the heart of Roman culture. Right. She suggests that this emptiness was due to the Romans' endless wine-fueled orgies in cramped vomitoriums. This humorous, albeit somewhat inaccurate, depiction of Roman culture highlights Kunk's tendency to focus on sensationalistic details. She then introduces Jesus Christ, describing him as an almost Christ-like figure who arrived to fill the emptiness in Roman culture. This circular definition of Jesus as an almost Christ-like figure is both absurd and amusing. Yeah. It highlights Kump's tendency to state the obvious in a way that seems profound. She then recounts the story of Jesus' birth, noting that he was born in a stable, which she deems, ironically, not a stable environment for a baby. This observation is typical of Kunk's comedic style. Right. She often points out ironies and contradictions in historical narratives. She then describes the angel Gabriel's visit to Mary, suggesting that Mary was impregnated not by a holy ghost, but by a man and a sheep, like in Scooby-Doo. This blasphemous comparison of the Immaculate Conception to a Scooby-Doo episode highlights Kunk's irreverence towards religious beliefs. She then discusses Jesus' carpentry skills, noting that it's ironic that he's named after the two words you're most likely to shout after hitting your thumb with a hammer. This observation is both humorous and insightful. Yeah. It highlights the way language can reflect human experiences, even painful ones. Kunk then discusses the crucifixion of Jesus, observing that he endured 
The physical agony of being nailed to a cross, while also knowing what a great logo would make for his long-term campaign. This cynical view of Jesus's suffering highlights Kunk's tendency to view historical events through a modern commercial lens. She then questions whether Jesus was the first celebrity victim of cancel culture. This anachronistic use of the term cancel culture is both humorous and thought-provoking. It is, yeah. It suggests that Kunk views historical events through a contemporary lens, drawing parallels between past and present. Kunk then discusses the spread of Christianity, asking you whether it provided people with a sense of purpose and value. This seemingly sincere question is likely a setup for a comedic response. She then recounts a story about her friend Paul, who had a near-death experience and promised Jesus that he would believe in him if he survived. Right. When Paul did survive, but with serious injuries, Kunk asks, why did Jesus do that to him? Kunk's question, while phrased in a comedic way, actually touches upon a profound theological question. Yeah. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's almost like a cosmic prank, isn't it? It certainly challenges our understanding of divine intervention. Yeah. But remember, we're taking Kunk at her word. Right. So if we accept her account as accurate, it raises intriguing questions about the nature of faith and suffering. Right. Kunk then seems to threaten Jesus on her friend's behalf, saying, Paul said, if I ever see Christ again, he's a dead man. It's a bold statement, it is. especially when we consider it as an absolute truth. Right. Is Kunk implying a power dynamic shift with humanity holding a newfound authority over divine figures? It's a fascinating concept. It is. Next, Kunk tackles the fall of the Roman Empire, attributing it to the Vandals, an ancient group notorious for their appetite for destruction, like guns and roses. This comparison, while humorous, might hold a deeper truth. Right. Perhaps the Roman Empire, like a fading rock band, succumbed to its own excesses becoming a target for those seeking to tear down the old guard. Kunk then shifts her focus to Islam, suggesting that its radical departure from earlier religions lay in the slightly different shape of its buildings. This architectural observation, while simplistic, could point to a deeper understanding of the relationship between form and function in religious practices. Right. Perhaps the unique structures of mosques reflect a distinct spiritual experience. Kunk then acknowledges the contributions of Islamic scholars, praising them for creating the first universities and libraries because they needed more knowledge to fill their libraries. If we take this as a factual statement, it suggests a direct link between architectural space and intellectual pursuit. Right. Perhaps the creation of these grand structures fueled a thirst for knowledge. Kunk then describes the Crusades as a sort of armed charity drive to forcibly provide the Islamic world with crucifixes. This cynical interpretation taken literally raises questions about the motivations behind these historical conflicts. Right. Were the Crusades genuinely driven by religious zeal, or were there underlying political and economic factors at play? Kunk, always the one for relatable anecdotes, compares the Crusades to her friend Paul's sponsored walk for charity, where he dressed as Spider-Man and suffered from diarrhea. This bizarre juxtaposition, if considered factual, forces us to rethink the grand narratives of history. It does. Perhaps even the most momentous events were driven by a combination of noble intentions and well-unfortunate bodily functions. Kunk then takes us into a medieval castle, describing a chaotic scene where the jester is threatened with execution for reading a threatening message from Robin Hood. Is she suggesting that medieval court life was essentially a reality TV show? That's an intriguing interpretation. Yeah. Perhaps the power struggles and interpersonal dramas of the medieval court were not so different from the entertainment we consume today. Kunk then questions the value of a particular medieval painting, asking if it's actually good. Or is it one of those things that we only think is good because we're told it's good like seafood? This astute observation challenges the notion of objective artistic merit. Right. If Kunk is right, then our appreciation of art is largely shaped by external influences and societal norms. Right. What if taste is entirely subjective and those Renaissance masterpieces are just well fishy? Okay, so fast forward to the Renaissance. Mm. A term, kunk, initially mistakes for a condiment. Again, the seemingly naive misunderstanding could be interpreted as a profound statement about our relationship with history. Yeah. Perhaps we've reduced these complex eras to mere labels failing to grasp their true significance. Kunk then dissects Sandro Botticelli's The Birth of Venus, pointing out that Venus's hair is blowing in the wind, but the trees in the background are not moving. Right. Her conclusion, these people have been photoshopped in, and 
it's all fake. If we accept this as a factual analysis, it raises fascinating questions about artistic license and the construction of reality. Right. Perhaps Botticelli, like a modern day social media influencer, was more concerned with creating an idealized image than an accurate representation. Next up is Michelangelo's David, which Kunk praises for its detail but criticizes for a baffling omission. Okay. The lack of an anus. Right. Is she implying that even the greatest artists are fallible? prone to oversights that undermine their masterpieces? It's a bold assertion, but one that forces us to reconsider our reverence for artistic genius. Yeah. What yeah. if these celebrated figures were just as flawed as the rest of us? Of course, no discussion of the Renaissance would be complete without Leonardo da Vinci. Of course not. Whom Kunk compares to her friend Paul's failed attempt to build a treadmill for a pet snake. This juxtaposition of da Vinci's brilliance with her friend's absurd project is classic Kunk. It is. It reminds us that even the most celebrated geniuses might have had their share of less successful endeavors. Kunk then scrutinizes the Mona Lisa's enigmatic smile and inquires whether she's holding a balloon between her knees. These unconventional observations taken as factual challenge are interpretations of this iconic artwork. Right. Perhaps the Mona Lisa smile is not a mystery, but a simple reflection of amusement at a hidden prop. Kunk then criticizes a 14th century painting of the Last Supper for its lack of perspective, complaining that the room is squashed up and Jesus is twice as big as the others. Right. She praises da Vinci's version for its mastery of perspective. This comparison highlights the evolution of artistic techniques. Yeah. But it also raises a deeper question. Okay. If Kunk is right and perspective is crucial for accurately depicting reality, what does this say about earlier works that lack this element? Right. Are they flawed representations of the world? Kunk then throws out a real head scratcher. Which was more important, the Renaissance or Beyonce's single ladies? This seemingly absurd question forces us to confront our own biases and hierarchies of cultural significance. Right. Is it possible that a contemporary pop song can hold the same weight as an entire historical era? Next, Kunk mangles Rene Descartes' name, calling him Jim Descartes and asks if it's possible to think yourself into becoming someone else like Eddie Murphy. This line of questioning while comedic touches upon the philosophical concept of identity and the power of the mind. Right. If Kunk is right, then our sense of self is malleable subject to the whims of our thoughts. Kunk then describes the Enlightenment as a movement of metrosexual elitists and compares it to the release of the Belgian techno anthem, Pump Up the Jam. This bizarre analogy, if taken, literally suggests that intellectual movements like musical genres have the power to energize and transform society. She then mispronounces Jean-Jacques Rousseau's name, describing it as so French he might as well have been called Pierre Baguette, <laughs> before highlighting the hypocrisy of his humanist ideals, noting that they didn't apply to slaves. This observation, while delivered with Kunk's signature deadpan, underscores the limitations of Enlightenment thinking and the enduring legacy of inequality. Kunk then wonders if the American Revolution was sparked by linguistic differences, such as the British saying biscuits and Americans saying cookies. This trivialization of a complex historical event highlights the absurdity of reducing significant conflicts to simple cultural misunderstandings. Kunk asks if Beethoven was good at music, after first questioning whether he had an actual full-sized horse living inside his face, before misinterpreting his Fifth Symphony as just the word dumb over and over again. These absurd questions and observations, if treated as factual, challenge our reverence for artistic genius and suggest that even the most celebrated works might be open to wildly different interpretations. Kunk questions the need for Thomas Edison to invent the light bulb when people could see during the day because of the sun and concludes his life's work to be meaningless. This dismissive assessment, if true, forces us to reconsider the value of innovation. Perhaps our technological advancements are not as groundbreaking as we believe them to be. She then downplays the Wright brothers' achievement of flight, noting they could have walked that distance, and asks when the first flight was long enough to require a toilet. This focus on the practicalities of air travel, while humorous, highlights the often overlooked aspects of technological progress. Kunk questions how Marie Curie discovered radioactivity, if it's invisible and compares it to her aunt's chakra realignment business. This comparison of a scientific discovery to a pseudoscientific practice, if considered accurate, raises questions about the nature of truth and the validity of different ways of knowing. Kunk mispronounces Einstein's name and claims his theory of relativity is E equals MCU, before arguing that shadows move faster than the speed of light. 
These misunderstandings, if true, completely overturn our understanding of physics and challenge the foundations of modern science. Kunk then suggests communicating with the actors in early films to tell them to calm down because they appear to be moving too quickly. This observation, while humorous, reveals a fundamental misunderstanding of cinema and the passage of time. Kunk then celebrates the invention of sound in films, declaring that the written word's centuries-long era of tyranny was finally at an end. This hyperbolic statement, if true, suggests a dramatic power shift from literacy to visual and auditory media. So what have we learned from this deep dive into the Kunkiverse? Perhaps that reality is far more fluid and subjective than we realize. That history is not a fixed narrative, but a collection of stories constantly being reinterpreted and reimagined. That even the most absurd pronouncements can contain hidden truths, forcing us to question our assumptions and look at the world with fresh eyes. Or maybe it's all just a giant cosmic joke. Either way, it's been a truly enlightening journey. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. Indeed. And remember, keep questioning everything. Oh, yes. Even and perhaps especially the things that seem obvious. Absolutely. You never know what unexpected truths you might discover.